Greetings fellow passengers. So I found a video of my presentation that I made to Florida International University's ARCH program. ARCH standing for Advanced Research and Creativity through Honors. And being that it's an Honors College program, it would be expected to have the prestige and the connections that would afford to have an auditorium of more than, well, two people. But regardless, I'm releasing this presentation to the world for everybody to see a presentation on the business sector effects of Japanese investment and technology transfer in America's rail economy. All right, how are you doing, everybody? Okay, so I want to ask a question to all of you. Raise your hand if you absolutely love Miami traffic. Okay, so we're working with a sane audience here. Okay, now how many of you raise your hand if you love getting on an airplane and getting into the airport through all the TSA checks and all the security checks? How many of you love that? All right, so we we're, we're are sane. Okay, so what the project and research project I've been working on is bringing high-speed rail into America and the economic and political implications of working with how Japan has been able to do it. And I worked, uh, I'm in the international business uh, uh, college as well. I work with uh, Juan Carlos Espinosa on this, who's been the mentor and also the um, also the uh, the helper for also the High Speed Rail America Club. So we're gonna go to a tale of two nations. Now, after World War II, Japan was completely annihilated. I mean, there's no other country in the world that suffered through two atomic bombs, and Japan was that the only country in the world that has done through that. Meanwhile, here in the United States, while we had the envy of the world of rail transportation in the United States, you can see where we went. From 1939 to 2016, we got to this. Meanwhile, Japan, they've gone through pretty much uh, in the backwoods over to here. How, how and why did that happen? So let's, let's see how Japan was able to do it. Now, in 1964, Japan was going through an economic boom and they needed to be able to move more people in between cities. Now, the two largest cities in Japan and still are, are Tokyo and Osaka. However, because of the congestion they were having in the roadways and because the airlines and the airlines that they were putting up could not handle the stress of having so many people going into there, they needed to find another way. And during the 60s and 50s, it was already going to say that, oh yeah, the, the trains are already obsolete, there's no need for it, they're old style 20th century technology. Not at all. Um, back to get to Tokyo to Osaka, between there, it used to take 7 hours and 30 minutes by an express train. With the introduction of the bullet train, which is, the, as they call in Japanese, the Shinkansen, or that would actually translate to new trunk line, uh, they were able to have a train that was able to go from Tokyo to Osaka in just three hours. So that was less than half the time in 1964. Today, that same trip takes two hours and 25 minutes. That is an incredible feat. And also today, now, the whole uh, country of Japan has been connected through high-speed rail, and they've been able to connect into Hokkaido, which is the, one of the northern islands of Japan, the most northern north island, and uh, an unprecedented engineering feat to be able to connect an underground tunnel to connect high-speed trains and freight trains into there. And now they're even working on trains that go 375 miles an hour uh, through magnetic levitation. No, it's incredible what they're doing. Meanwhile, over here in America, it's a completely different story. Uh, 1971, Amtrak was founded as a public company in order to take over the floundering private corporations uh, that the private rail corporations were running. Now, why? what happened to the private rail corporations? Um, after the World War II, the United States put a ton of investment into airlines and also into roadways. And a lot of tax money that they took in from that, they overtaxed the rail industries at amounts of over 50% in order to fund that. So pretty much they sucked out the railroads dry in order to fund out for our railroads and for, uh, for the airlines and for roadways. And because of that they were able to at least save a little bit of those passenger rail lines and put it into Amtrak. And this, this is the trains that we have today. Uh, it's pretty much how some people call, uh, there was an editor on Vox News that says that uh, he calls Amtrak a Swiss priced tra uh, transit for Russian quality. So it's definitely not as good at all. And even back in 1939, it used to take Miami to New York, it used to take 25 hours. Today it takes 32 hours. <laughs> We've actually gone backwards. And I can attest to this uh, personally also too as well because uh, my family also takes uh, the trains also to 
to Miami to New York. Uh, my brother, he has autism and he has a fear of flying. That does not mix well when we go into an airport. So we take the train up to Miami to New York. And because of that, we have been doing that since I was seven years old. And I said, when I was about 19, I said, how can we change this? And I started looking into what we have and how well the countries have been able to do this. So that's where this research comes from. And also today, our infrastructure uh, by the American Society of Civil Engineers rated our infrastructure a D plus, which I guess counts for passing in American terms, I guess. But I mean, a D plus, come on. And that we would need $3.6 trillion in order to fix our infrastructure by 2020. And everyone is pretty much freaking out. It's like, okay, how are we going to fix this? What's the cheapest and fastest way in order to fix this and start this to move along? So let's take the story of Florida and where they were able to go with high-speed rail. Back in the 1990s, we had something that was called the Florida Overland Express. It was a plan to connect Miami to Orlando through a French-style TGV train, a train grand vitesse, which is uh, the high-speed rail, and in order to connect it in two hours. Uh, it was a private-public partnership, and unfortunately, because of funding allocations and because of what was going on also, too, with Florida at the time that they were losing money, uh, the governor of Florida at that time, Jeb Bush, had to cancel the program, which he recently, for, for, first he did support it, then because of funding allocations, he had to cut it off. Same thing happened again in the late 2000s and 2009 and 2011. Uh, again, the Florida High Speed Rail Authority was, was uh, introduced in 2004, and then we, 2009 things got really interesting. Uh, president Barack Obama, who became the new president at that time, introduced a plan called the High Speed Interpassenger Rail Act, which was an investment act to put in $12 billion of funding into high speed rail all over the United States. So $12 billion sprinkling it here and there. So there was a lot of governors who did get into it first of all. Uh, Governor Rick Scott of Florida and also uh, Scott Walker of Wisconsin, uh, most uh, uh, notably were the ones that signed into the program first. However, it became a huge political powder keg in 2010 with the rise of the Tea Party and a very huge split between the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. And the Democrats took this as a sort of a political foil to say, well, high-speed rail is our thing and it's not your thing, so if you're with us, uh, this is a Democrat thing. And the Republicans didn't like that at all, so it became another funding issue again, and Governor Rick Scott in 2011 killed off the program and the $2.5 billion in funding it would have taken from Tampa to Orlando. Now today, we finally have a different story. It's we finally are getting high-speed rail. In 2017, a private, uh, private company is building right now Florida, all over Florida, which is uh, a private uh, initiative to build between Miami to Orlando. And if you go in right now to downtown, you can see them actually building the gigantic uh, station that they're going to have. So this is a huge station. It's a huge initiative of what's going to bring Great Rock over to as well. This is Miami to Orlando in less than three hours. Now, it's not a quite exactly high-speed rail since the train goes 125 miles an hour. The Federal Railroad Administration deems that anything that's over 150 miles an hour is high-speed rail, which we don't have anything that's real high-speed rail in America because then I wouldn't be talking about this. Um, they're right now building the trains also, too, in Sacramento. So these, these are American jobs that stay here. American working, American jobs, and this all stay here. We all benefit from this. And this is what the station is going to look like when it's done. This is a whole uh, multiplex, multi-use, residential, uh, apartment complexes, and also a mall underneath here. This is where the train's gonna go. They're gonna go on top on the third floor. So when you actually enter into the station, it's gonna go, you're gonna actually go up into the station. So it's an incredible amount of investment that is being put here, especially because now this board is along Overtown and Downtown Miami. So right now we're uh, with uh, what's going on in Florida East Coast and what they're, the amount of investment they're putting in. They're getting a lot of jobs that are being put in from Overtown, a lot of workers that are coming into here, and it's getting them a lot of jobs. So this is helping in a lot to help these poorer communities and to, to fix them up as well with this infrastructure investment. Now, uh, America 2050 is an organization that also put out a map of what a high-speed rail America could look like and where we'll be able to have all these connections in. Right now, of course, as we're talking and speaking right now, we're getting Miami to Orlando with phases going into Tampa and Jacksonville later on. That's what all aboard Florida is planning. But also, too, in the United States, notice that the three biggest states are right now the three uh, projects that are going on right now. In Texas, uh, they're also building 
a rail line also too as well from Dallas to Houston, and San Francisco to Los Angeles is also getting one built as well. So why is it Japan? Why Japan that we need to um, get in, uh, in partnership with to be able to do this? Uh, we surveyed 100 people. Survey says that the number one country they want to actually get uh, involved with, the Americans want to get involved with, is Japan. These are the top three countries, Japan, Germany, and France. These are all countries that already have high-speed rail already in there. Uh, so th there's a lot more positivity that comes with working with Japan in order to bring this in here. Also, too, there are political um, allies also, too, as well. This is Caroline Kennedy and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, uh, the completely ridiculously fast 370 mile, five mile an hour magnetic levitating bullet train. So it's insane what they've been able to do. The history and expertise also, too, as well, at, factors into this um, as well. Because of what's, uh, what Japan has been able to do um, with the bullet train line, that they've been able to make it earthquake proof also, too, as well. Now, who remembers the 2011 uh, Tohoku disaster that happened over in Japan? You guys remember that, right? It was completely terrible. It was a uh, disastrous amount of damage that it took a toll on the country. I'm sorry, no. I think it's my fault because I left that on too long. All right, that's all right. I'll, 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 I'll speed it up a little bit. So, high speed rail, high speed presentation. So. <laughs> um, but anyway, I was going back on the, uh, the earthquake uh, argument. Um, the bullet train system that they have now, the earthquake system that they have, all the, tr the trains were able to stop safely, and none of the, nobody was able, uh, none of the trains were able to derail, and everybody was safe because of that. And by the way, they've been able to move 10 million passengers um, in Japan through the high-speed rail lines. None of them have been killed, none of them have been injured, there's been no derailment. So it's the safest system in the world also too as well. Right now in Texas, they are actually building America's first and rail bullet train through the Japanese Central, uh, uh, Central Railway and is getting financing and engineering expertise also too as well. This is going to connect Dallas to Houston in 90 minutes, 205 miles an hour. This is going to bring 40,000 jobs also too into the local economy. And is also looking into future expansion into San Antonio also too as well. In California, they're also planning to do the same thing also too as well. And they're building it right now in 2028 to connect LA to San Francisco in two hours and 40 minutes at 220 miles an hour. So, these are all real projects that are happening right now that's going to be real investment, something we can touch, see, and feel to be able to see that now America's you know, coming back out of our recession and be able to give uh, thousands of people jobs. In fact, the California project itself is going to get 100,000 jobs into the local economy. That's amazing. Um, unlike the two other projects, Texas Central Railway is actually a private finance co uh, company, which means there's no taxpayer money into this. It's all finance through private investors and through private uh, uh, companies. California High Speed Rail is a public, private public partnership, which means they're getting some public funding and some private funding, but the company itself is running itself as a private organization. And this is sort of following up what Japan also did as well, because they were also run as a government corporation. They were failing in the 80s, and what Japan did was they split all the railroad companies into private companies, and they were able to begin uh, rolling again and be able to gain profits. Now, political roadblocks. Are there actually political roadblocks right now between the parties? Right now, there's actually not. What do you, what do you think these two guys have in common? And please not, don't say ARP discounts. Actually, both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders actually support building high-speed rail and infrastructure investments. So we, we, it's pretty safe to say that both parties actually do support the, the building of, uh, of high-speed rail. However, the biggest political risk is misallocation and uninvolved leaders. Now, we do have some leaders here in South Florida and also across the, the United States that have been sort of demure on building high-speed rail, and they've been pretty uh, uninvolved with trying to build this. So that's pretty much the biggest political risk, but as of so far, there's no war going on between the, the left and the right about on this. Both can agree on this. However, the largest opposition threat um, comes from the citizens itself, that is uh, pretty much a small uh, vocal minority on trying to stop high-speed rail. Um, these are a group that we call uh, NIMBYs, which is an acronym for Not In My Backyard. Of course, Florida, we always get the, the, the craziest of uh, opposition groups, uh, which they were calling uh, All Aboard Florida, uh, All Aboard Auschwitz, uh, for some very insane reasons, because Siemens was building the trains for Florida because Siemens is a German company. Um, they're actually building the trains over here in Sacramento, but still because it's a German company, they 
wanted to find some way about it. This is in Texas of what's going on also here and also in California as well. So there are some uh, aspects of this. However, once the projects start building, they usually tend to disseminate and disappear. So, and I also had um, some experience with this as well, and I have met with the opposition groups, and so I am very involved with trying to bring this also here as well through, uh, through political meetings and also through meetings also too as well uh, with finance boards and with the companies themselves. However, the largest incoming competition or threat for high-speed rail is none other than the airlines. This is, I caught CEO, former CEO for better or for worse now, of Spirit Airlines, who loves Spirit Airlines? Nobody here, uh, same, right? nobody loves Spirit Airlines. Uh, ben Baldanza is saying that the economics of high-speed rail doesn't work anywhere in the world and it's not a good competitor in Europe. The statistics say otherwise. Uh, from Paris to London, the bullet train there has a market share of over 81%. That means 81% of the travelers from Paris to, to London actually take the bullet train, not the airlines. And it's all, it's all around Europe also too as well. The other thing is also two Southwest Airlines has tried to kill high-speed rail also too as well, which they've done in Texas before in the 80s when the French were trying to put their system also there as well in, uh, to connect San Antonio and Houston. Southwest Airlines put lobbied a lot of money to kill the project and they were able to do it successfully. Now they're thinking of trying to do it again. And also the airlines do get a ton of subsidies from the U.S. government also too as well, which would hurt uh, they're standing if they were able to lose all their flights because the biggest profit that they get is from short haul flights. These are flights that go from 250 miles to 300 miles and 500 miles, which is the biggest market share of uh, that is taken by high speed rail. Now, the economic impact of the United States would be uh, pretty enormous if we were able to build this. This is about hundreds of thousands of jobs we're bringing and also increased transit oriented development. Right here in Miami, because we're able to build this system, Hitachi just opened up a plant in Southwest Dade in order to fix up the metro rail lines also too as well. So these are going to be the metro rail trains, the new metro rail trains that we're going to be getting uh, in 2019. Millions of cars are also going to be off the road also too as well. So if you drive, it's much better also too as well. All Aboard Florida has predicted they've been able to take off 3 million cars off the road through a third party, party study. It's also clean energy as well. Because of this, uh, we're able to, um, these are electric trains also too as well, and they've been able to be uh, less uh, vicious to the environment of than let's say airplanes or cars. In fact, uh, the bullet trains here that you see here take uh, use 12 percent of the energy than in, uh, a Boeing. Uh, increase in productivity also too as well. For example, in China, when they were able to build their train also too as well to Beijing, they saw a 10 percent productivity increase. And also tourism increase also too as well. Once they were able to open up the Eurostar between London. And Paris, they saw uh, Disney, uh, Disneyland Paris saw more customers also going in there as well. And you also get more infrastructure renewal throughout the United States, finally starting up to build up and fix up America's infrastructure. And just quickly, I'll just thank uh, people who helped me in the research. Uh, the FIU Honors Cause, I want to thank Associate Dean Dr. Juan Carlos Espinosa for mentoring me and helping me out. Uh, big thanks also to the Florida East Coast Industries who runs all aboard Florida and I was able to intern with them and get information on them about this project. Uh, California High Speed Rail Authority, I was able to interview the Chief Engineer Scott Jarvis on information about this. Texas Central Railway, which I was able to interview the president of that company, George Robert Eccles. All aboard Erie, which I was able also to interview uh, the president as well, Brian Pitzer. And of course, my organization, the High Speed Rail America Club, which has been advocating, collaborating with these companies in order to make this possible and to give a national vision for high speed rail. All right, anybody have any questions? No? So far? All right then. Thank you so much. <laughs>